Follow me. Two words every soul in creation is confronted with. A command, a verdict with eternity as its gift. Follow me, Jesus says, and deny yourself. Pick up your cross, baptize, and make disciples of all nations. This world will persecute you. But seek him, proclaim him, acknowledge him before men here on earth. Be reconciled, innocent, raised again to a new life. Follow me, he says, and you will know the Father. This is what it looks like to truly follow Jesus. Well, I'm excited to jump into our scripture today. We're in a sermon series called Life on the Mountain. We're working our way through what's called the Sermon on the Mount. And today we are in Matthew chapter 7. We'll be in verse 7 in just a minute. Jesus is going to focus on prayer today and and the verses that we're going to cover. And, you know, when it comes to prayer, many of us in the room, well, let's just be honest, we need a lot of work. (laughs) We don't really, you know, feel like we pray enough as Christians, and so I think this is probably one of those topics where we're like, oh man, here here we go, right? Um, I I think even the most avid prayer warrior in the room would probably admit that, you know what, I I don't pray enough, and and, uh, if you kind of were raised in church, there's just kind of this intuitive, like, knowledge that you're not doing good enough in your prayer life, And, and that's because there's always room to grow in prayer, and I don't think anybody ever really feels like they're doing it enough or they're doing it well enough. And and so we kind of go into what I call a shell of shame when we talk about prayer in church because everybody just kind of hunkers down and just be like, yeah, we're terrible. I'm not any good at it. Go ahead, Trent. Punch me right in the nose, bro, because I need it. I know. I'm a terrible person, right? We just kind of feel that way sometimes when it comes to prayer. And on the other side, Even though we kind of know we're not good at it, we sometimes think that we're never going to be good at it. Have you ever felt like that? Like, you know what? You're right. I don't pray enough. I'm terrible. My prayer life stinks. And there's this part of me that just kind of thinks that I'm never going to be good at it. I'm never going to get it. Prayer is for super spiritual people like pastors and worship pastors. Maybe the youth pastor. Probably not him, but maybe, you know. And so what do we do? Now let's think about it. Why is your prayer life suffering today? What is it about your prayer life that, that's not going well? Maybe it's because you don't live with a desperation in your life. Like, you're, you're not desperate. You're not in a desperate situation. And so if there's not a desperate situation going on in your life, you kind of feel like you got it under control. And so sometimes that leads to, you know, not, not a lot of prayer in your life. Perhaps you don't believe God's going to answer. Maybe you don't believe in God or Maybe you do believe in God, but you just don't think that he's going to answer your prayer because you've prayed before, and, and, and that prayer didn't, you know, come to be, and, and so you just kind of gave up on the idea, like, ah, it's just not for me. Maybe you think you can live without God's intervention in your life. You just kind of feel like, you know what, God is, is busy. He's got a lot of big things happening around the world. He doesn't really care about my measly little problems. He's got bigger fish to fry. But what if I said the answers to your prayers and and the prayers that you are are offering up to God today, if he were to answer those prayers, that wouldn't even be the best part of prayer. What if our whole understanding and concept of prayer is, is, is actually wrong? What if our prayers aren't really so that, so that God would know what we need, but, but that God already knows what we need, and so prayer is, is much different. The whole point, the whole purpose of prayer is just different than what we kind of grew up thinking. What if the biggest blessing of prayer wasn't the thing you wanted, but it was the thing that you needed most? What if the design of prayer wasn't for us to get what we want from God, but it was a way for God to get us where we need to be. In a culture where anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness affecting 40 million people across our country, almost one in five people, we live in a state of worry and a state of stress. The, The busyness of life, the chaos of our schedules, 
We're just constantly living in a worrying like state of mind. You're worried about school. You're worried about your marriage. You're worried about your kids. You're stressed out about a situation that's happening at work. You're, you're worried about money and, and are you ever going to really get out of debt? You're worried about, am I ever going to accomplish anything great in life? You're worried about, you know, am I going to please my spouse? Am I going to please my parents? You're stressed out about, am I even going to get married? You know, maybe I'm going to be single my whole life and, and you're worried about that. For whatever reasons, we live in a culture that's just stressed and worried and anxious on a regular basis. We live in this state of stress. And we, we, we're surprised when we uh, see the abuse of alcohol on the rise. We wonder why. We wonder why obesity has grown to the second leading cause of preventable diseases in the United States. We wonder why prescription drug use has become the third leading cause of death in the U.S. You see, we're looking for a place of peace in our life. And, and, and so we run to alcohol to give us a moment of peace. We, we run to food to give us a moment of peace. We may run to prescription drugs to give us a moment of peace. But intuitively, know, we know that it's not quite working and and every time we look to the word of God and, 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 and hear it taught, we begin to realize those things are never going to work. And so what do we do? How do we deal with it? One thing that I do believe the scripture does teach us clearly, the one thing that does work is prayer. For some of you, the place that you need most is the place of peace. And today, I want to encourage you and help you begin to pursue that place in your life. To, to get there, you, you need a faith in Jesus, and then you begin to trust that God is who he says he is, and he's, he's going to do all that he has promised to do in your life. So then you don't have to worry. You, you just simply begin to trust, and, and finding that place of peace only happens in our life when you and I begin to pursue persistent prayer in our life. Think about it. How would your life be different if you truly found the place of peace in your heart, in your soul? If you had relief from that anxiety that's plaguing your soul, if, if you were able to release stressful situations that, that came into your life on a regular basis, you, like you knew how to absorb it and to deal with it, how would your marriage look and feel different? How would your work environment look and feel different? What about your family? And then we look at our spiritual life, like how much growth would we begin to experience if we were actually experiencing the place of peace? You see, if you had that peace, no matter what devastating issue you've experienced this year, you would begin to experience this peace that would overcome and transcend all understanding. In the midst of anxiety, in the midst of stress, Jesus invites us on a journey that will take us and lead us to this place of peace. And in our scripture today, he's gonna to tell us how to get there. Let's look at verse seven of chapter seven. If you have your Bibles, if not, it'll be here on the screen. These are the words of Jesus, and he says this, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? Very familiar passage, I'm sure. Let's dive into this. I think the first thing I want to begin to share with you is just the character of God. Because we see in these very short verses here, a couple of things about the nature of God, the character of God, that when it comes to prayer, you and I need to understand. And the first thing is this. God does not play games with your prayers. He's not like toying with you on every single word that you're saying and, and trying to trick you and hook you into something that you, you didn't intend. Here, here's an example. We were praying for our dream house. We've been praying for our dream house for years, and then God finally gave us our dream house. 
In the first week, we realized that our house was built on an ancient Indian burial ground. It's haunted. I forgot to be a little bit more specific in my prayer. <laughs> like I prayed for the dream house, but I forgot to exclude all ghosts and spirits in my house. Like how silly is that? I mean, when you think about it, some of us have some of these thoughts. Like I asked God for this, but is he really gonna do this? Is he gonna trick me? Is there, is there something else that he's gonna call me to do? Like if I pray for growth, he's gonna make me move to Africa. Is that how this is gonna work, God? I'm not praying that prayer, God, you know? The ancient Greeks told stories about their gods and their gods always answered prayers in an unusual way and they did always have a twist. There was always a hook and and one story was of Aurora. She was the goddess of the dawn and she fell in love with a a human being named Tithonus and the king of all gods, Zeus, told Aurora that she would give her whatever prayer she asked and, and she would give it to Tithonus. And so she thought about it and she said, okay, I want you to grant Tithonus immortality. Let him live forever. And so he did. The hook though was that she wasn't specific enough and she didn't say, I want him to be young forever and live in immortality. And so Poor Tithonus got older and older and older and older and more wrinkles and more gray hair, and he lived forever, and the prayer turned into a curse. Now listen, that's not how God works, okay? You can, you can kind of breathe this morning. He's not going to play games with you. If you're asking him for bread, he's not going to trick you and give you stone. Now, now the, if you know anything about uh, a loaf of bread in the first century, you know, no yeast, it kind of looked like a, a kind of a large, smooth stone that you might find in a river here in the Smokies. And so the, the kind of the comparison is, I'm asking for this, it kind of looks like this, and God's going to trick us with something that looks, you know, very similar. He's not going to do that. If you're asking for a fish, it could also be translated as, as an eel, like one of those kind of eel-shaped fish that are in the sea would have been f- familiar for them, and, and, and then he's going to slide a, a snake. Like, that's not how God works. He's not going to trick you in your prayers. You can trust that he is going to provide and do what is right. Now, here's the second thing that I think we learn here. The heart of God is to give. The heart of God is to be generous. And his point here is that you, as a parent, you have the ability to give your kids good gifts. How much more does your heavenly father? Jesus says, you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your kids. How much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to you? He's he's just like emphasizing the fact that our God is a generous God. He wants to provide for you. He wants to give you uh, good gifts. He wants to bless you in ways that you don't even really comprehend today. We can trust him in that. Now, here are a few passages of scripture that help us understand his love for us. This is Romans 8, 32. Paul says, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Now, here's the argument that, that Paul is giving us. He's saying that God didn't spare a son, that God, our heavenly father, gave us the ultimate gift in Jesus. How much more can now we trust him because he's given us the ultimate gift, the greatest gift, that no one would have ever thought that he would truly give to us, and he gave it to us. Surely he's gonna provide in other areas. Surely he's gonna bless us in other areas and give us. This is the point that Paul makes. Now, on the flip side, if, if you don't know that you have Christ, if you don't know that, that Christ has saved you, you don't have that confidence, then when you go to God in prayer, then that confidence isn't there because you haven't experienced the, the, the most incredible, generous, and most you know, unspeakable gift that God has ever given to us, which is Jesus. But once we do know that we have him, then we can trust that he's gonna graciously give us all things that we need. Here's another passage that I love. This comes from Isaiah 49. He says, can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. God's comparison really, really stirs our heart because he, he turns to a woman, a mother, and, and we know what motherly love feels like, and, and, and so we know that nurturing love is there, and, and he says, look, a, a mom's not going to forget her nursing child, is she? And then we live in an evil world, and we sit back and we say, well, even though a mom's love is incredible, sometimes moms do forget their kids. 
Sometimes moms think it's their right to even abort their kids. Sometimes moms do abandon their kids. And so God puts the caveat here, and he, he says, okay, I will never forget you. Like, you might have experienced abandonment. Maybe your mom, your dad, your stepdad, your stepmom didn't provide a nurturing environment at home. And so that might make you feel at times like you're alone. And if your marriage isn't going so hot, you might feel really alone, even though you live with someone and there are even maybe kids around. But here's the reality. God says, no matter how you feel today, I have not forgotten you. No matter how many times you've prayed this prayer and and you don't sense that God is answering that prayer, he is saying, I am with you. I am right beside you. You say, I can't feel him. And his word tells us the truth that he is there and he has not forgotten you. And his love is so great for you. Here's another passage that I love in Romans 8. Paul says, likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now, here's what he's saying there. There are moments in your life where you may, okay, I'm going to take a time to pray. I'm going to spend this with God. And then you begin to pray and then you don't know what to pray for. Maybe your heart is so heavy, your heart is so broken, you're like, God, I don't even know what to say. Maybe I've said it a hundred times, and so I'm just sitting here in your presence. And and he says, in those moments especially, the Spirit of God is going to pray on your behalf with words that, 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 that can't even be comprehended so deep, so in love, so powerful that the Spirit is praying on your behalf. That is a groaning that should encourage you in that moment that God is with you. And God is praying for you through the Spirit. And then here's the deal. According to the will of God. Now, you may not like that part. You might just wish it said according to your will. But praise God, life doesn't happen according to our will. It happens according to God's will. And God's will is always perfect. God's will is always powerful. God's will is always the path to peace in your life, even if it's difficult. And so according to his will, we pray and we trust that he himself will answer in his time. Now, another part here that that we see in this passage is just the nature of prayer. And the nature of prayer is really unfolded in how the the, the Greek language was written here. The the Greek language has two kinds of imperatives. The the aorist imperative, which is used when you want to give someone a definite command, like shut the door or pick up the book. And then there's the present imperative, and it's used to uh, explain a continuous action, like keep shutting the door or keep picking up the book. And in these verses, the, the present aorist form is used. And so essentially what he's saying is, you need to keep asking and God will answer. You need to continue to seek, continue seeking him and you will find him. Keep on knocking and the door will be open. So the idea is that we need to experience a persistence in prayer because it tells us here that persistent prayer is answered by God. Persistent prayer. Now, the problem with this is that doesn't seem to make any sense to us. Like, think about it. The the problem does, it it seems like, you know, if God's not going to answer immediately, then prayer's not so attractive. Like, why do I want to jump into a prayer life if God's not going to answer me immediately? And by the way, why does God want me to continue to ask him for the same thing over and over and over and over again, doesn't he get annoyed by that? (laughs) Uh, Any parents in the room can kind of relate to this. If you've ever been on a long trip with your kids, they're like in the back seat, you're about 45 minutes, an hour into it, um, and guess what happens? One of the kids inevitably is gonna say, are we there yet? How much longer? Like we've been in the car for an hour. Like you you can't just keep playing Xbox, you can't keep playing an app, For another 30 minutes, you know, it doesn't matter how long the trip is. You know, parents, when we get asked that question by our kids, we we tend to lie about stuff at that point, you know. 
Is that, is that okay to lie to your kids? Like, like if you tell them the truth, they're going to whine, they're going to complain more. So we're kind of tempted to lie. There could be another six hours to go. And as a dad, I'm going to say, almost there, guys. <laughs> Keep watching your movie. Let daddy drive, right? So you kind of give me that. And then an hour passes by. Are we there yet? Almost there, guys. You do that a few times, and they finally figure it out. I'm like, dad, you said we were almost there four hours ago. When were we going to get there, you know? And they kind of freak out, and then you kind of snap back on them, and you, shut up. Everybody be quiet, or you may not get there. Been lying to you for 20 years. I'm going to keep, you know. <laughs> we turn into evil people in the car on long trips. We need the grace of God. But when, when people ask you for the same thing over and over again, isn't it kind of annoying? So that's why when I read this text, I'm just, I kind of push back and say, wait a minute. That doesn't, that doesn't make sense to me because my flesh is saying, just ask once. And then, you know, he's got it. Like when you first got married, you told your wife, I love you and I want to be with you forever. Like you said that on your wedding day. But is that the last time you need to tell her that you love her? Well, <laughs> somebody thought that was funny. <laughs> Somebody's experiencing that. <laughs> oh, really? Obviously, that is not the case. And so when it comes to, to, to God, there's something more that's happening here in, in our prayer life that I think he's trying to teach us. And I think it's all in the journey. It's all in the, the, the journey of how we're going to experience the grace of God in and through our prayer life. And so when we look at this, he tells us to keep on asking, to keep on knocking, to keep on seeking, not because it benefits him, not because he needs that, but that the more I talk to God, the more I am in his presence, the more I am in prayer, I am directing my heart to the love and power of God. And it's in that powerful moment that I get to the true center of what prayer is, which is not something I'm asking for, but it's someone I'm meeting with. You see, the place of peace is when I am with Jesus and I am centered around him. Persistent prayer is answered by God. And secondly, we see that persistent prayer isn't for God's good, it's for your growth. So it's not that God needs me to keep asking him before we finally convince him to do something, like an annoying kid. No, persistence in prayer actually affects my growth, actually affects my spiritual depth, with my Savior. So most people like to serve God when everything is great. It's easy to tell God you love him when everything is going great, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's kind of easy. It's like rooting for a winning team. Everybody loves to root for the winning team. That's why there are bandwagon fans everywhere. You know, Kawhi Leonard just got traded to the Clippers. Um, Paul George uh, traded to the Clippers as well. And guess what? Lots of Clipper fans all of a sudden, right? And, and, and so we see that. Maybe one day our kids will like UT football when they start winning, if they start winning. I don't know. Maybe that's too close to home for you. But, I mean, we love to root for the team that's winning. And, and, and so a lot of times we treat God the same way. When things are going great, we, you know, we love him. And we're all about him. And we, we are excited about church. It's like going on a mission trip. When you go on a mission trip, everybody's excited to serve God. Like, People go and talk about their faith who have never talked about their faith. They get up and they talk about, you know, uh, in front of crowds, um, their, their testimony, and they, they've never done that to one person, but now they're up in front of people all the time, and, and that's how we treat God. I mean, listen, you can grow in the exciting times of your life, but life isn't always exciting, is it? Oftentimes, life brings a lot of challenges and loneliness and heartache, and, and so what are you going to do in that moment? See, life's going to be difficult sometimes, and, and the persistent prayer, the waiting, is the area in which God grows you the most. And life is going to bring you different seasons, all kinds of different seasons, great times, not so good times, boring times, all kinds of different seasons in your life. And if you only experience Jesus in the exciting times, you're going to be a weak Christian at best. If you think God is, is only a loving God when everything is going great, you may not really be a believer at all. You see, God wants us to demonstrate consistency, persistence in prayer. Do you really trust me 
he wants, he wants us to know. Do you really trust me? Are you really depending on me? Are you really seeking me? Are you really depending on me? Or are you just running to me for a quick fix? God already knows the answer to that, but we need to know the answer to that. And the only way that we know the answer to that is evidenced by our persistence in prayer or the absence of prayer. There's a story in Luke chapter 18 where Jesus tells a parable. And in the parable, uh, he tells us the whole point. Actually, Luke tells us the whole point of the parable in verse 1 of 18. It says, And Jesus and he and Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. So essentially what this means is, Luke is telling us that Jesus is about to tell a parable, and a parable is a story that Jesus tells that always has a point. And he says the point of this parable is that you should always pray and you should not lose heart. And then he goes into the story and he says this widow is, is offended in some way. She is wronged and she goes to the judge and she pleads her case. But the judge doesn't care about God, doesn't really care about what people think. And so he ignores her and he puts her off. But in her persistence, she continues to go back to the judge. And then here's what it says in verses uh, two and following, four and following. It says, for a while he refused, the judge refused. But afterward, he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, I don't care about God, I don't care about what people think, yet, because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the righteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So, at first glance, you might take away the idea that, well, I guess I need to start bothering God, and the more I bother God, the, the, the better chance I have of him answering my prayer. But Jesus' point is not that God is this judge that needs to be bothered and harassed before he responds to our request, but that how much more will our God, who is a righteous judge and loving father, how much more will he bring about justice in your life for those whom he has chosen, those who cry out to him day and night? How much more will he do this? That's his point. And, and so we go back to verse one where Jesus says, okay, the whole point of this is that you won't, you won't give up on your prayer life and you won't lose heart. And that's exactly what happens, isn't it? When you're praying about something, you're waiting for God to answer. You've said it once. You don't see any results. And so you begin to lose heart. You get disappointed. You're tempted to give up. You're tempted to say, you know what? God doesn't care. You're tempted to say, God's not here. And the point for Jesus is like, look, 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 look. The rhetorical question is this. When the Son of Man returns, will he find someone of faith? Here's what he is telling us and suggesting to you and I. Unanswered prayer is a test. It's a test. Will he, find, will he find a man or a woman in this room of faith? Here's how we know if you will. Let me throw some unanswered prayer in your life and see how you respond. I don't know that my staff is united until there's a disagreement. They can say all day, we love each other and we're united. As a church, we can, we can cry out, we're one, we are one, we're united around the vision, blah, blah, blah. But you don't know that's a reality until there's a disagreement. When there's an un unanswered prayer in your life, when there's a disagreement, that's when you know who's with you and who's not with you. And I think Jesus' point is clear. We don't always get what we ask immediately we don't always know what we really need in life. And so we ask for ridiculous things. And God patiently waits for us to grow in our faith through persistent prayer. I mean, what if we got everything we ever asked God for immediately? How would, how, how would we respond? I mean, we'd treat him like some genie in a bottle if that were the case. We, we would totally not appreciate or love him for who he is. It would all be about give me what I want now. Just go look at some of your kids and how they treat you, and you can find out what it looks like when you give them everything they want when they want it. 
little monsters running around, aren't they? <laughs> gotta be, you got to watch. You got you to gotta be diligent and wise in that. And so God is with us. And so here's the application. Here's how we put this into practice. Trust that your generous God, we've already learned that he's generous, he wants to give you many blessings, that your generous God will answer your prayer in perfect love and in perfect wisdom. He will in perfect love and in perfect wisdom answer your prayer. Are you willing to slow down and wait for it? Persistence demands patience, waiting, and that is the fertile ground that allows your spirit to grow. It's where you experience health because our natural inc inclination is, is always just to use God and, and not to love God. And so we need this unanswered prayer to stir our spirit. It doesn't always seem loving when, he, he, when it doesn't feel like he's responding to us or when we're not receiving that answer when we want it. But this is the journey to the place of peace. If you want true contentment and true peace in your heart of hearts, in your spirit, so that you're not worrying about this thing and worrying about that and stressed about this and running to this stressful thing and blah, 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 then you need to join the journey that Jesus invites you to. And that journey is the journey that leads to the place of peace. And for you and I, I know a lot of us, we might think in our flesh it is screaming out that, that God is not there that God does not care. Maybe we're, we're wrecked by a certain event that took place in our life and on the surface it feels like God isn't coming through for us. But just think for a minute. How many times have you asked God for something? You've knocked, you've sought after him a time or two, didn't hear anything, and then you walked away right as he was about to open the door. I went to see um, Spider-Man this weekend with my kids, and great movie. At the end of the movie, they run the credits. You know how it is. When the credits come up, movie's over, right? So you get up, and, and you leave. Well, if you know anything about Marvel movies, you know that there's always a special clip that comes after a few minutes of credits, right? And so... You know, half of the theater gets up. This is good stuff, by the way. Like, this is knowledge you did not know you were going to get at church. Half the theater gets up and leaves. And so I kind of get a little prideful and arrogant, just shaking my head. These poor people, like, they don't know what they're missing. There's going to be a clip. There's always a clip. And so we're sitting there, and, and uh, sure enough, the credits are running and, and going through. And then uh, we, we get to the clip, and the clip was great. It's very, very informative, wonderful clip. Learned a lot. When the clip was over, I stood up, and I'm getting ready to walk out. And my son Bryson said, Dad, wait. Be patient. There's more. And I said, well, there's more? What do you mean there's more? And so just sit down and, and just wait. So I sit back down, and they start running more credits. And this time, it was like a long time. And I'm looking at my watch, several minutes going by here. And now we're, we're at the credits where, you know, it's like, the guy that stood by the trash can, you know. And I'm like, I don't care about this guy and all the famous, you know, all that stuff was gone. And so now it's getting really, really boring. And I'm like, seriously, I don't think there's another clip. Let's just go. And Bryson said, Dad, be patient. It's coming. It's coming. Sure enough, after several minutes, the clip comes up. By this time, 90% of the theater was gone, and there were only a few people left in the theater that got to see an amazing final clip, right, with, with a lot of great information that I will not spoil today. And I just started to go home that day, and he, we were talking about it, and a light just kind of came on for me. And that light is how many times have I, have I asked God for something, I've knocked a time or two, and then I have, in my impatience, walked out of the room. God didn't answer, God didn't hear, so I'm just gonna go do it in my own strength. And I think the word that some of you came here to hear perhaps, maybe it's time for you to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Don't leave too early. Don't leave before God shows up. Because here's the reality. 
God might be on the verge of opening the very door you have been praying about for years. I think that what God wants to do in your heart, what God wants to do in your life is is so much greater than you give him credit for. Be patient and, and, and wait for it because God is just around the corner. Turn to the person next to you and say, wait for it. Tell them to wait for it. They need to hear this. Here's the bottom line. Persistent prayer is the pathway to the place of peace. Persistent prayer is the pathway to the place of peace. You want to know why 40 million people are suffering from an anxiety disorder? Because they have chosen not to take the journey of persistent prayer with Jesus that leads us to the place of peace. See, the place of peace is is where Jesus is. It's in his presence that we experience that power and peace in our life. It's not where you get the perfect spouse. It's not where you get the perfect house. It's not where you get the perfect job or the perfect kids. It's not where you get everything you want or whatever material possession your heart desires. No, the place of peace is where Jesus is. And your ultimate journey in life is to seek him and to be with him. And that persistent prayer is the pathway that will lead you to the place of peace. You see, the biggest blessing of prayer is not that you get the thing that you've been asking God for. It's actually getting the thing that you need most, which is Jesus Christ himself. My dad was telling me the story this past week about how he had prayed for years that his older brother, Jerry, would come to faith. And he had shared the gospel with them hundreds of times, and he hadn't responded. Uh, Uncle Jerry actually went to church one day to hear Dad preach, and and at the end of the service, this is when, you know, back in the day when they would call decisions to come forward, and and Dad was at the front, and he had just preached the gospel and gave the altar call, and he said he actually saw my Uncle Jerry step out into the aisle as if he was going to come, and then he stepped back in. A prayer that that dad had prayed years and years and years and years and years. But something was different about that experience. He said later, what I came to to, to realize in my prayer was that I was praying for him to be saved, that I would have an opportunity to lead him to Christ. And then all of a sudden my prayer shifted. And my prayer shifted after that. And it was just, God, bring somebody into his life that would share the gospel see, that's what happens in persistent prayer. God, do this. God, do this. God, do this. Oh, wait a minute. God, you could probably do this too. And that. Oh, God, your heart begins to change desires. God slowly moves you into a place of peace. A couple weeks later, one of the local pastors in that town decided he was going to go out and knock on some doors, share the gospel. He'd get shot for doing that today, but back then it was okay. <laughs> He knocked on his door. Jerry invited him into his house. They talked for a long time. He shared the gospel with him. And that day, he prayed to receive Christ. A prayer that dad had prayed for years finally came to fruition. Persistent prayer is the pathway to peace. Are are you willing to go there? Are you willing to walk with Jesus through through the difficulties and and the good times? Through, through maybe some boring times or some, some times where you have a lot of questions, some, some times where you're really busy and you're not focused, are you willing to say, you know what, I need to figure this out. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to kind of dive into a deeper walk with who this guy named Jesus is. My heavenly father is a generous God. There is something bigger happening in my life. Are you willing to walk with him into a place where you finally discover the peace that transcends all understanding. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. Let's close in prayer and worship today a little bit as we conclude. I wonder how many of you in the room would say, Trent, there has been a prayer that I have been praying for years. God has not answered it yet. And, And as I hear this today, like I'm encouraged 
to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. How many of you would say that's you in the room by show of hands? I've got a prayer and I'm not gonna stop. I'm gonna keep praying. I'm gonna keep going after it. I believe that at any moment, God might show up and he might open that door. At any moment, God's gonna release the floodgates of blessing in that area for me. Praise God, all over the room. Keep on asking, keep on praying. How many of you would say, for me, where I'm at in my prayer life is that it's, it's pretty non-existent and I just need God to reach down in some way and wake me up, like, like draw me in. How many of you would say that? I, I need a touch, I need, a, I need an opening, I need something. I'm gonna pray for you today all over the room. Father, you saw both hands. You saw hands that said, I'm gonna keep on going, I'm gonna keep going and trusting and there are others who are just in a place, in a season of where, God, I, I, I need to see something here. I need you to reach down. Lord, I pray that even this week, you would bring that to fruition. Help them to have the eyes to see it, though. Help them to have the, the wisdom to understand it. Lord, in this room, I know there are people that are far from you, and I pray that, that you would draw them close to you. Lord, there are prayers that have been offered to you hundreds and hundreds of times and there are people in the room who are ready to stop and ready to give up. Maybe they've already quit and I pray that today you would, you would draw them in and encourage them to not give up. Persistent prayer, persistent prayer leads to the place of peace. Lord, help us to discover that place today and every day as we pursue you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, can we, can we give God a round of applause and just praise him today? Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand and worship.